Hi class, so now that we've taken a look at chapter 7, um, I'd like you all to watch the video on chapter 7 for answers uh, and solving of some problems from your homework and your in-class assignments. Uh, what I'd like to have you do is try out the assignments yourself. Now remember the homework, you get 100 uh, just for attempting the problems and working through them. Uh, it's I use it as a guide to help me figure out how you guys are doing in the class and what additional material I need to go over. I will also, when I post your grade, I will post comments next to your sections. So if you take a look at your in-class assignments, there's already uh, comments for you regarding take a look at this, take a look at that, uh, look at the solution and such, and all of those items uh, will be popping up um, after your homework is submitted tonight. So take a look at that. Um, and now we're gonna talk about cash and internal control. So internal control is the process that establishes the reliability of accounting records and financial statements to ensure that the assets are protection, protected. So think about, um, for instance, think about a hospital. So the hospital protects what? Do they protect their beds? Like are their beds chained to the walls? Uh, most of the time, no, right? Because how hard is it to take a physical bed and take a hospital bed and roll it out the door and no one notices you taking their hospital bed. But what about their medical drugs? What about their narcotic drugs and such? Those are locked up, you need a password, you need a key, you need something to get near those. So that there is a control, an internal control over the physical inventory uh, that they have. So taking a physical inventory facilitates control over merchandise. Mm -hmm. So what this is, it's a process of actually counting all of the merchandise on hand. And then it must be taken under both uh, the periodic and the perpetual inventory systems. And merchandisers usually take physical inventory after the close of the business day, on that business day of the last year. So if your company's year end is 1231, you would take your physical inventory on 1231. Now think of, you know, Old Navy taking a physical inventory or Walmart taking a physical inventory versus, you know, your little mom and pop store taking a physical inventory or even a hospital. It takes a lot to count all of the items in process. Um, it takes a long time. So you have to be very specific about when you can count your physical inventory and how you account for that. Now, one might ask why take a physical inventory? And the reason you take a physical inventory is because you need to know what you really have. So think about, you know, let's go back to the retail for scenarios. Think about theft. Think about how many people shoplift. So if two people shoplift a pair of jeans each day, by the end of a week, you've lost 14 pairs of jeans, essentially. So you need to know as a business, you need to know that you're missing 14 pairs of jeans. Um, now, for instance, a hospital, they might take um, inventory of the narcotics every day, every week, every what. I, you know, I don't personally work at a hospital, but most likely they're taking inventory of those narcotics every day and such. Or they're monitoring who takes in, who takes out. So when they do count their physical inventory, they can note who touched that bottle. So now we're going to take a look at the components of internal control. And uh, an effective internal control has five interrelated components. So what that means is they kind of all go together to create this one system of internal control. So there's the control environment. It's created by management's overall attitude, um, awareness, and actions it encompasses. So what this is is I like to think of this as management's tone from the top. So if the boss doesn't care, if the boss just leaves early at four o'clock and doesn't care that he had to work the extra hour, how often are the staff members going to work that extra hour? So that's a tone at the top. So if the boss is very ethical, holds ethics in high uh, regards, lets you know that their operating style is what needs to be followed and monitors that, then most likely the employees are also going to follow suit with that. They also set up the organizational structure. So what that means is who's monitoring what? Do you have a boss? Is someone looking over your shoulder? They also have a method of assigning authority and responsibility, and then personnel policies and practices. 
Um, there's also the next component is risk assessment. That involves identifying areas in which uh, risks of loss of assets or inaccuracy in the accounting records are high. Um, so what it means is what's the riskier area? So for a retailer, you know, their physical inventory is a risk. Um, you know, things like that can go missing. In a business that's, you know, say like a, uh, a hospital, obviously the drugs are a riskier area. No one's walking off with the MRI machine, right? So that's not really a risk. Yes, it's physical equipment. It costs a lot, but it's there. The risk of someone physically stealing that, probably not going to happen. Um, so the next component is control activities. Those are the policies and procedure management has in place uh, to see that its directives are carried out. So what have they set in place? Who does what? And we'll look a little further in this chapter about who should be doing what. Um, the information and communication that pertains uh, to the way accounting systems gather and treat information about a company's transaction and how it communicates uh, individual responsibilities within the, within the system. So think of an accounting software when I think of this. So I need a password, you know, to get into Moodle, I need a username and password, right? So think of a computer system. You need a username and password to get into that. Do I have access to everything just because I logged into the, you know, say I'm a nurse. Can I see patient records? Can I go through different things? Probably not. Can I look at the billing or see how the hospital, you know, enters in their accounting soft software? Most likely not. Why? Because you're given rights and responsibilities in a software. Um, so with that, it also looks at the transactions and how you're allowed to do it. So someone is setting, you know, the IT gurus we have are setting who has rights, who has responsibilities. So monitoring is management's regular assessment of the quality of internal control. <clears throat> Excuse me. This involves uh, a periodic review of compliance with all policies and procedures. So it's not enough to just set the policy and procedures. Someone has to actually check and see if, number one, you're following the policy and procedures, and number two, are those policy and procedures working? So you can have the best laid plans, but if you don't follow through with it, what does it even matter? Right? It does not. Same thing goes with internal control. So uh, the goals of control activities is to safeguard a company's assets, ensure the, reli sorry, the reliability of accounting records. Standard controls include things like authorization. So it's approval for certain transactions and activities. So recording the transactions to establish their accountability for assets. All transactions need to be recorded. And then you also need uh, documents and records. So you need well-designed documents to help ensure that transactions are properly recorded. So different things. Think of um, think of Amazon, for instance. You click the button. You order something. You know, you're a Prime member, of course. You click the button. You order something from Amazon. You, in your box, have to not only get your product. You have to get your shipping receipt. Uh, and what they go well what they call a packing list so basically when you press that button buy it now Amazon someone in the warehouse let's pretend it's a person who knows someone in a warehouse is going physically picking your product putting in a box and putting the paperwork noting you purchased this those are all different types of controls and different authorization um, so one of the main things to look at for authorization is someone who signs something. So if a company has a policy that a check cannot go out, if it's over $5,000, cannot go out with two signatures, that's authorizing. Not only is the president of the company have to authorize it, but the controller has to authorize it. So then we also take a look at physical controls. It limits access to assets such as cash, registers, and storerooms, as well as accounting records. So we're not just talking accounting software that has, you know, a password. We're talking, can you even get to pa things? So think of, uh, one of the items I like to talk about is think of payroll records when you're thinking of records. How many of you can just walk into your, you know, into your HR or your payroll person's uh, office and just go through the payroll records? No, right? You can't. They're locked up. They're, you know, they're segregated. Most, most of the time we don't even know where they are. We might not... We might know who has them, 
but we don't know where they are. Um, also, like storerooms, you can't walk into Old Navy and walk out back, right? You can't walk into their storeroom. Why? Because it's locked. Only specific people have keys. Cash registers, also locked. Um, so you can't, you know, you walk up to pay something and you can't necessarily grab into the cash register and take what you want. Also, a physical control is different things such as locking up the entire inventory. So what this means is, you know, either it could it could uh, include the security tags, you know, the little ink tags that it's annoying when the uh, stores don't take it off your clothing. Um, so those are physical controls because that's preventing someone from taking the asset. Um, there's also, as I said, they're narcotics for hospitals, and I don't know if they lock up their Tylenol. They might. Um, but the drugs in a hospital, they're behind lock and key. Most of the time, they're behind a computer and lock and key. That's to restrict the physical controls for the assets. There's also periodic independent verification. Someone other than the person responsible for the accounting records should periodically check the records. So if my job is to reconcile the bank account, someone should be checking my work. Someone should be seeing that I am reconciling the bank account and you know that everything I did was right. Um, there's also a segregation of duties. Now segregation of duties vary depending on uh, you know how big the office is. Let's think of your little mom and pop store versus big Y at this point, right? Someone works in a tiny little grocery store. They have maybe seven employees. Big Y has hundreds of employees. So these things vary. But the important aspect to take away from this is that no one person should authorize the transactions, handle the asset, and keep the records. Why? Because they can record anything they want oh no we never got that product so basically I get a ship I get shipped in a product you know I decide I want to take it home it's okay because I get the transaction I handle the assets and I can record the fact that we never got the product or guess what I never even ordered the product so sound personnel practices include adequate supervision rotation of key people among different jobs insistence that employees take vacations and bonding of personnel who handle cash and inventory. Why do we care that someone takes a vacation? A lot of the times when there is fraud or theft in a company, uh, internally, it's, and it's normally from employees who don't take vacations. Why don't they take vacations? They don't because they can't afford to have someone catch their stuff. They can't afford how they're fixing the records because guess what? In order to take money out of a business, uh, fraudulently, you need to cover your tracks and basically, you know, inaccurately record items in other companies. So you get cash in from ABC company and instead of recording it, you know, taking away the receivable from ABC company, you take it away from DEF because you need to uh, account for the money you already took from DEF and such. So bonding is the process of checking an employee's background and ensuring that the company against theft. So it's getting an insurance policy on uh, your employee basically to cover you from theft. And it's also, it's also an extensive background check on your employee to verify that they're trustworthy enough in the instance to uh, control the cash. So um, internal control and achieving objectives. A system of internal control for merchandising activities can uh, achieve uh, important objectives. They can prevent loss of cash or inventory. They can assure that the records and transactions and account balances are accurate. They can keep enough inventory on hand to sell customers without overstocking merchandise. They can keep uh, sufficient cash on hand to pay for purchases and such. Uh, they can also help monitor uh, time to receive discounts if your cash is high enough. They can keep from credit losses uh, as low as possible by making credit sales only to customers who are likely to pay on time. So how does an internal control help you keep credit losses low? A lot of people are like, uh, okay. And the way it does that is it basically requires when you set up, when, you bring, when you're bringing in a new uh, customer to check their credit to look and see if they have enough credit, if they pay their bills timely, what is their reputation, or are they a business that's almost going under and they're trying to save themselves. So to me, I'm not gonna extend credit by allowing you to buy 
uh, my product without paying cash immediately if you're about to go bankrupt. So maintaining controls is especially difficult for a merchandiser because uh, management must not only establish controls for cash, sales, receipts, purchases, and payments, but they also must protect its inventory. Most firms use the following procedures. They separate the functions of authorizing, bookkeeping, and custodian uh, having custody of the cash. Limit the number of people who have access to cash and designate who they are. So not everyone has cash uh, and can touch it. They also bond all the employees who have access to cash. They keep the amount of cash on hand to a minimum uh, by using banking facilities. So have you guys ever seen the sign on, um, you know, at convenience stores, we only keep $50 of deposits or $500 on hand at times. That's to prevent someone from theft. Um, to also physically protect cash uh, on hand by using cash registers, cages, and safes. They record and deposit all cash receipts timely and make payments by check rather than paying in cash. They have a person who does not handle uh, or record cash make unannounced audits. So that's having someone randomly come in and check it. Um, you also have a person who does not authorize or handle it uh, to record t cash transactions and to reconcile the cash bank statement. So if I'm in charge of um, if I'm in charge of inventory, you can then have me reconcile your cash because I don't touch it. I have nothing to do with cash in general. Um, to avoid theft, cash payments should be made only after they have specifically been authorized and supported by documentation to establish that it's valid. Uh, and the specific amount of the claim. A company should also separate the duties involved in purchasing goods and services and the duties involved with paying them. So if I'm bringing something in, so I say I order, you know, for my, for the hospital, you order three TVs. I'm in charge of purchasing, I order three TVs, and then I pay for them. Well, guess what? If I'm the one paying for them, I could say technically I only paid for two TVs and take one home. Um, so that's an example of that. Um, taking a look at cash equivalents, management may decide to invest um, some excess cash into different things like short-term uh, interest-bearing accounts, um, CDs, which is a certificate of deposit at banks and other financial institutions. You could also buy uh, government securities such as U.S. Treasury notes and other securities. Uh, if these investments have a term of 90 days or less, when they are purchased, they are considered uh, cash equivalents because the funds can easily be reverted to cash so quickly that they're treated as cash. So although they're in an interest-bearing account or they're a CD, I can easily go to the bank and say, nope, I need that cash and get the cash out. So some of the cash controls... Uh, in addition to the internal control over the transactions, other ways to control cash include an impress system. It's a system, it's, uh, it's a, basically uh, such as petty cash funds used by a company for small expenditures and cash advances. And they're normally uh, restored to a fixed amount. So what, what happens a lot of times is business will have a $100 petty cash uh, drawer. And what that is is, oh, we need bagels for the morning meeting. Okay, here's $10 from petty cash please go buy the bagels and bring back the receipt and such. So that's really just to help that, you know, occasionally you do need cash, but there's only specific reasons for what cash can be used for. So banking services you can get, you can get safe deposit boxes for um, cash. You can get negotiable instruments and other value documents such as stocks and bonds for cash. You can have checking accounts. You can have collection and payment on certain terms of debt set up um, by banks. You can also exchange in foreign currency. And there's electronic fund transfers. Uh, it's a method of conducting business uh, um, with a company in electronic transfers from the bank. Uh, instead of writing a check, it's an actual uh, physical transfer into a bank and out of, a, out of your bank account. And then there's also ATMs, the automated teller machine, and debit card transactions. Uh, when purchases are made with the debit card, the amount of the purchase is deducted automatically. 
Um, so what happens with all this? What do you have to do? And basically you have to reconcile your bank account. So the process uh, of accounting for the differences between the bank balance on a company's bank statement and the balance in its cash account. So like any checkbook, for those of us who still balance our checkbook, and yes, I do balance mine to the penny, um, like any checkbook, you have, you know, you have, say your bank balance says you have $1,000, but you know that you just wrote a check for $400 that hasn't been cashed, your cash account should say $600. Although the bank says you have 1000 in the bank, you do, technically, but you've already um, written a check and essentially paid out that $400. So the bank reconciliation, um, common, common transactions that appear uh, but are not in the bank statement is outstanding checks. So that's check a company is issued and recorded but it has not yet uh, been cashed. There's also deposits and transfer. So these are deposits uh, a company sent to the bank but the bank did not receive it in time to enter into the bank statement. So that's, you know, think about it. When you deposit money now, it normally has a hold on it. It doesn't, you know, show up till the next day and such. You see it in there, but technically you can't draw, withdraw the funds. That's what a deposit in transit is. And the reason you would need to reconcile for these items is, remember, um, like our balance sheet, cash is cut off as a specific day. So if you're year end on 1231, you go to the bank at 7 p.m. and deposit a check. Most likely on 1231, that is not going to show in your bank account until 1 1 or 1 2 and such due to the timing of holidays. So uh, transactions that may appear on the bank statement but not be in your records could include service fees um, for a checking account, um, non-sufficient fund checks. So that's a check that a company has deposited but um, it wasn't paid because basically you didn't get your money because it was a bounced check. Um, Miscellaneous debits and credits, these could include fees charged for other services, um, stopping a payment on a check if you had to call it back, printing checks, um, collections on promissory notes and different things, interest income if you have an interest bearing uh, bank account, uh, interest paid on an average on your average bank account, uh, you could also not have on your in your system until you get the bank statement. Um, so we're going to talk, uh, in the last few slides, we're going to talk about petty cash a little bit more. So it's sometimes necessary to make, uh, you know, the small payments of cash, things like postage, shipping charges, uh, minor purchases of like office supplies. So all of a sudden, you know, although you order from WB Mason all of your ink and everything in your paper, all of a sudden you're printing something and your printer runs out of ink. You can't call WB Mason and get it there in an hour, but yes, you can go to Staples or wherever and purchase your ink. Um, so for situations in which it is uh, inconvenient to pay by check, most companies set up a petty fu uh, cash fund and usually use the impress system in which the fund is either established for a fixed amount. So sometimes you'll do a voucher document for each cash payment made. Um, the fund is uh, periodically reimbursed based on those vouchers by the same exact amount. So AKA if you always have $100 in your petty cash amount, um, when people start to dwindle, once you get to $50, you replenish that uh, back to $50. And um, the custodian of the petty cash should prepare a petty cash voucher or a written authorization for expenditures, showing them below. So basically it means um, the person who receives the money um, or who receives the payment signs for the voucher. So a lot of times what companies actually do is they look for the receipt. So like I said, if I go to Staples and buy the ink, you know, say someone gave me $30 to buy the ink, the ink costs $25.99, I need to come back with my receipt and the um, $4 and a penny, essentially, um, to fix the cash, petty cash funds. So that's cash and internal controls. Please make sure you read the chapter, take a look through it, email me with questions. Um, if you like, shoot me an email. I can open up a discussion board for the class if you guys want to talk amongst yourself and such. Um, I had one last semester. People didn't really seem to use it, um, but I am open to bringing it back. Please email me with questions. 
please watch the chapter seven video that will be posted later. Uh, it'll be posted probably at the start of Saturday morning. I'll open it up. Uh, actually, it might be Saturday afternoon um, because it, it takes time to upload these. Uh, but please let me know if you have questions. Email with questions. Um, cash and internal control is more learning the process, learning procedures, and going over different things. So thank you very much.